esta ocasión vamos a hacer la charla en inglés por obvias razones. Entonces voy a voy a presentar a Tomás. Hello Tomás. How are you? Tom? Good. Very well. Pretty good. Very good. Yeah, I was telling them that it's going to be in Spanish that you're going to practice your Spanish. So so it's, that's uh, great, no? <laughs> It's one of the problems of living on a, a small island. <laughs> Everything's English. Okay, we're, we're that's fine. Terrible. That's fine. <laughs> we, we, we can talk a little bit of English here. That's fine. So uh, it's, it is the 18th right there, one day after. We're on the afternoon. Good morning for you. Good afternoon for everybody. And, uh, and welcome, welcome uh, to this uh, talk from... Tom from Room 11, you represent a, a whole team, I know. Uh, I invited you because we met a long time ago, not too long. You had long hair and I didn't have a gray hair. So so we're, we're even. <laughs> I'm just trying to look younger now. I've yeah. got so much older, you know? No, I'm, I'm not, <laughs> I'm fine. <laughs> so, so I've been looking at your work uh, recently and, and I've been following your work since uh, since we met uh, about seven years ago, and 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 I've been impressed from the beginning. And every time you I see new stuff that you guys are doing, I I, I get more impressed about it. So so that's why I wanted to I wanted you to share uh, some of the, the the process on how do you get to to design and 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 to get all these good results, and and also we're very intrigued on how 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 do you guys work as a team also because it's a uh, I know that it's a it's a it's a whole team working on the design process. Also, it's not a, a linear uh, design uh, uh, type of office. So uh, I'm very curious, and I'm sure the students are also curious about it. So I'll just like to you to start if if you if you if you can, and, and thank you for accepting the the invitation. Thank you so much for inviting me. <laughs> Here we go. Okay, you can see that? Yes. Okay, great. Um, room 11 is a, is a small practice. Um, we were a lot larger at one point. Uh, we had offices um, in Victoria, uh, which is the sort of cultural capital of Australia and in Tasmania. Um, our Um, essentially, I, I, I didn't find that to be a fantastic experience. It was a lot of travel. Um, and I think my discernment and my interest in architecture is, is about quality and sincerity. Um, so we sort of deliberately scaled us to a point where everything we were doing was, was meaningful um, and significant. Um, And there's a, a genuine level of desire to, to make very sincere work. Um, and also an understanding that um, people respond well um, to that type of approach. Um, but currently we've got five key personnel. Um, The practice originated um, from a background of, a, of an art school process. So we, we were in a large art school with a very small architecture wing. Um, and the culture was dominated by an art background, uh, far more so than, than architecture. Um, and it's interesting to see the evolution of, of the practice and to have this opportunity to, to review how things have changed. Um, just to mention, as you, as you pointed out, architecture is a collaboration. Uh, I have some key engineers um, that I have worked with um, since that practice was established. Um, the key people sort of started working together in 2002. Um, and I've, I've now become the sole director 
So just to mention who's who's in this image, we've got uh, Brenda Chu, who's a, an architectural graduate. Um, Kate Phillips, who's next to me there. She's um, my life partner and senior associate in the practice. Um, to my right is uh, Jason Park, who's a fantastic architect. And we've got uh, Calvin Markham, who's an engineer and an architect. So it's, we've always been a very engineering focused practice, very focused on modes of production. Just to talk a little bit about our discernment and, and how that developed. Um, Tasmania is a quite a large island, um, but it's the first landmass in the Southern Ocean between Antarctica, um, significant. Um, so we get an extraordinary quality of light. Um, I used to own a piece of land. This, this painting is by Pechene and Tasmania was a place to come. It was in the roaring forties. So you could sail from Europe quite quickly. Um, and it's drawn people to this island because of the landscape and because of the quality of light. <clears throat> uh, this is a, another painting by Pechene, which is uh, in black and white, interestingly enough. And I think I hypothesize that, that he put together a painting in black and white well before sort of abstraction existed because he was trying to display the qualities of light in this particular place. Um, and I think that's bred a, a very sig significant part of our approach to architecture. Um, Tasmania is a, quite a, a brutal place. Um, we have this very interesting um, life where our architecture, our education is essentially European or international, um, but we live in a, an ancient landscape that's only been settled by Europeans for a short period. Um, and you can see the sort of brutality of intervention against um, stark wilderness. Um, and it, that's something that the reality of place um, and the capacity to see that as a, interrogate that as a tangible entity is very much core to our work and it's sort of an honest depiction. And this is obviously an image after a fire. I take a lot of photographs, but I found this quite beautiful as well, um, but it's not picture postcard. This is on the west coast where we're still, it's still like a, a colonial, you know, very recent colonization of a, a rugged landscape. Um, similarly, I've taken a lot of images um, from this sort of artistic background that are to do with travel and experience. Uh, and that's translated into our architecture as well that uh, the process and the series of steps which lead to an experience or a revelation or a realization of place is integral to, to our development, excuse the phone, <laughs> in Tasmania. <laughs> That's fine. It's in the you morning. <laughs> Um, fine. You can answer if you want. That's fine. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, no, I know. Um, yeah, again, I, I've really enjoyed, you know, seeing that simple sort of cut through the landscape of rural development, um, and then we have forest and uh, intense weather quite often. So this has just been part of my habitation, I guess, of the island from a very early point. Mm -hmm. Part of what's interesting about, about that, about living in a place where um, 
wild nature is still established. It, it can be viewed. Um, and that's not to disregard the fact that the island has a, a very long indigenous history and it was actually quite manicured, but I'm not going to go into that at this point. Um, but it raised questions for us about permanence, um, about how do we um, live in a place responsibly, about the key question of opening up a discussion with ourselves about the very real fact that everything we do as, as humans, every act of habitation displaces something else. Um, and and do, is there some beauty in that? Is it is it just a uh, questionable, or is it actually fascinating? Uh, and, and it is, you know, inherently our, our condition. This project here, this is clearly a, a montage. It was for our IP twenty one hundred project, um, which was part of the um, Australian Pavilion at the Venice Biennale. Um, and it was just this sort of simple line of extreme density and connecting Tasmania back through to the, the greater mainland of Australia. Mm. Tasmania has a, there's a couple of key things about this image for me, um, which is, it was a world first. It was, it's the Gordon River Dam um, it was the first thin plastic uh, dam structure in the world. Um, and I guess for me as, a, as an architect and someone who experienced a lot of bushwalking and, and nature, um, I found this really exciting and, and, and it, it questioned in, with me the, the modes of production. And I guess an obvious query was how come um, engineers are having so much fun. They're doing these incredible structures um, and architects at the top, you know, particularly in terms of our education, we're still arranging little sticks. Um, and, and I guess there's a, a very popular adage in, in Australia in, in terms of architecture, particularly for them from the sort of warmer climates, which is about touching the earth lightly, um, which is uh, to paraphrase Glenn Merkitt's term, and he's a huge influence on me and fantastic architect, but it doesn't ring true in a cooler landscape and it didn't um, measure up um, when, when viewed simplistically it didn't correlate with our discernment of being in a place of rugged wild nature and very strong modern um, intervention. Mm -hmm. And I was, I, I think I've always been continuously drawn to, you know, um, infrastructure. Um, and the, the simple fact of it as a relief from the picturesque beauty. Um, so this is a, an image of, you know, some fairly generic um, fencing to stop rocks falling on a road, but it's in a really beautiful landscape. And it, what was interesting about it for me was why was I photographing this instead of the water, uh, you know, the, the beauty, beautiful view. And I, I think there's a, an important question for us as architects about why we do what we do. This is an early project. Um, and I think it, it actually probed some of those questions without us realizing we, we sort of went on for another 10 years after this, not revisiting the territory that this, this building um, prompted. Um, this was a, the client for this project was a, a war veteran who was an expert in, in bomb disposal and he wanted to have a, a bunker to live in. Um, <laughs> which seems quite silly. Um, 
but I think it it was a very strong project and it was an approach that appealed to us and it referred to our capacity to utilise um, sort of generic infrastructure to, to create transcendent architecture. The client was also a sculptor. Um, and this was an underground building where we we buried the whole house and then essentially created a, a fairly simplistic bunker. Um, when I met Jorge, um, I just completed the following project, which is um, the Glenorchy Art and Sculpture Park. Uh, again, there's a desire to utilise generic materials efficiently. Um, this is essentially a treated pine structure. It was extremely cost effective. Um, we've got this beautiful little finger sort of detail. Um, and it's also, it's a three kilometre park and there was a need to create a sense of destination, not just uniformity. But I think this project also promotes thoughts about not only do we want to recognise the modes of, of production um, for architecture and infrastructure, but there's also a very real need for joy in that and playfulness, um, which this you know, clearly adheres to and it's become quite a popular destination. On part of the journey of GAS, so this is one of the pavilions we put together, which I think talks to our agenda in terms of creating buildings. Um, this was replacing a very simple picnic rotunda. Uh, I was given the challenge by the client to um, create a building um, that replaced that structure. That was essentially it. Uh, and I had to it was with whatever money I'd left over from the, the boardwalk construction. Um, thankfully, I'd saved a little bit. Uh, I don't think they were expecting a building of this sort of scale. Uh, <laughs> it was meant to be like a tiny little barbecue facility. Um, but I think it's very clear how our architecture works and how our approach to building an intervention works. There are significant trees, a significant eucalypt and a significant pine tree. Um, and I wanted to bridge between those two. And then we've got this very simple framing of the water and the view. And I really enjoy architecture where, yes, there are other qualities that sort of surreptitiously present themselves, but the basic agenda is very clear. And there's a, a logic in this building about timber construction, uh, about efficient steel construction. Um, the, the columns here are seven metres apart, but the roof thickness is only 100 mils and they're central. So we pre cambered all the roof um, and had a sort of very active intervention in the construction to make it super thin and, and neat, which was good fun. Um, the ultimate destination of, of GASP is this cantilevered pavilion. Um, and as I mentioned before, the, the sequence of experience is very important to me, the theatre of, of arriving at a building. In this park, there's a constant western wind. It's pretty much nine, nine days out of 10, there's a westerly. And you walk around the bay for three kilometres, um, being battered by that wind. And then I've I put this huge wall here. So once you go past this little threshold and walk towards the pavilion, um, it's silent. And then you have a 42 meter procession towards the pavilion um, in silence. And the planting on the, on the right hand side there is all grown up now, which is quite, quite gratifying. Mm -hmm. um, and when you arrive in the pavilion itself, um, you have this amazing moment of seeing the landscape that you've been walking through, through this red glass uh, and seeing it in a completely new way. Suddenly, all, all we've done is basically move a building or 
or an experience that always looked to the west and then we've just flipped it onto the to the east mm -hmm. it's very simple um the to talk to construction as well um this is a quite a simple portal structure we've got a 12 meter well not simple but 12 meter cantilever 17 meter tie it's a 410 ub um universal beam and it's this was a movement for us where my technical knowledge and experience and relationships with uh, industrial fabricators had had taken prominence over more traditional methodologies for um, constructing buildings and I found it to be more economic um, and I think that's an interesting factor too that a lot of architects have a, a, a fever, you know, a, a strong desire to build. And you're always searching for finding out ways to procure buildings cost effectively uh, with the maximum amount of impact. Um, Is here the client, uh, the, the city or county or hmm. who's the client? This was um, a city council. Hmm. We also had a small federal um, grant for the for the park. Okay. Yeah. So, and this is it looks pretty much exactly the same. It hasn't changed a great deal since it was built. Um, one of the interesting things about this project, I think, as well, is that it, unlike sort of ten years previous or, or many projects where you frame a particular aspect, this pavilion frames nothing essentially water and a sort of infinite gesture towards the horizon uh, and then the courtyard that it creates actually frames the landscape and it becomes the sort of fourth wall of that courtyard experience one of the interesting things about you know this project and you can see it here very well. Um, my fascination is with the sort of the visual beauty of the rolling hills um, and the sort of industrial heritage and the modes of, of production. Um, and when this building got to this stage, I'd, I'd previously built that little timber pavilion and I had a fantastic relationship with the contractors. But as this started to take shape, um, people started to question what, what I was doing um, because it was just so brutal. Um, and uh, the moment that we, we put the glass in and put the reflective, the bright and yield stainless steel and you saw the water reflecting on the ceiling and this sort of transcendent experience, I had everyone back on board. It was a really fascinating experience and I'm sure most architects question what they're doing at a certain point. There's a, you know, you have your design phase and then you have to become belligerent. <laughs> and then there's a moment when you've got everyone convinced that you can actually question yourself uh -huh. and wonder about why you're doing what you're doing. <laughs> um, and essentially here, you just see that we've very simply, similar themes all the time, creating a horizontal datum around the building allowing you to see the contrast with the, the beautiful rolling landscape. And also I'd edited out the suburb, um, which is in the foothills, which is not, not particularly beautiful. Um, when we creating projects like this, this was a, a, a dancer from, um, Sydney who'd come down and, and performed a piece in the space. There are all these beautiful moments that people share with you. People have been married here. Um, and it's, it's a building that adapts well to a lot of people. Um, but there's also, there's, you know, it's also a place for solitude. It's, it's near schools. Um, and I think good architecture has to have a moment where there's a realization. It's strong enough for you to notice that you exist at a particular time 
in a particular place and you're having a, an experience and, and that reaches everyone. Um, and public works, just such a great opportunity. I, I thought during this design process that um, children truanting from school would probably come here. Um, and, yet, and yet we'd also have weddings and you know, traditional sort of celebrations. And there's a, a need for a, a brutal structure also to have playfulness and generosity. Um, and I think there's an implicit Tasmanianness. There's a part of my understanding of place, of this particular place, is manifested in this building, and hopefully that connects with our clients. Mm -hmm. I think planting is a, a very important part of our, our work, and I have a, a sort of surreptitious desire to uh, reinstate. Um, native vegetation and celebrate it where possible. Mm -hmm. I put this one in just very particularly because I had a photographer um, who was making a, a film of this project and he said to me it looked like a, a Mexican prison. You can tell me if that's true. I, I'm not sure. But I, I really love this part of the building. That, but what did they tell you? That it's it appeared to be a, a Mexican prison, oh. which I didn't think was a compliment. <laughs> I don't think so. <laughs> no, I don't. You guys have great prisons. I don't know. I thought this was good. No, no, no. <laughs> They're not that great. <laughs> <laughs> um, you know, again, horizontal datum, some playfulness and colour, which creates destination and difference. I think there's a real point in our building and construction where as the scale changes, our agenda has to change and adapt because we're not responding to context, we're creating it. Uh, this is also a, a water scrubbing facility. Um, the, the building was also, it's really interesting to see um, how you, you create a, a building um, and then it develops its own life and some of that is not what you expect. Um, this was used by um, BMW. It's a promotion for one of their top end cars. Wow. Um, and that was that tickled me a little bit because I've seen those images of, um, not that I'm comparing myself, but Mies, he, his buildings at Wiesenhof were used for Mercedes. So uh -huh. <laughs> I, I was excited. And I'm much further away. You know, they had to travel a long way to get here. Um, it was also used as a, uh, there's this huge international um, food event, which was full of celebrity chefs and various people. I wasn't invited, um, <laughs> but they used the building. Uh, you couldn't get tickets. I couldn't bribe anyone. But yeah, it's just great to see something adapt and be appreciated to a, with a wider audience. Um, Something that we've always maintained, as I said, about uh, we've had a, a, an art background or an art discernment. Um, and it's interesting to see how our, our practice developed as a sort of collaborative art architecture practice. Then we became quite a, a standard um, architecture practice. And now that the practice is morphing back into um, having, you know, commissions that include pieces that are purely for experience, which are, I guess are on the edge of sculpture. Mm -hmm. um, and I've, the project I'll finish with is one where a Sydney art director sort of said to me, I love it when your work reminds me of Donald Judd. Mm -hmm. um, and I love Donald Judd's work. But that was a really fantastic brief and he's sort of given me an open slather really to create experience and buildings yeah. which is a fantastic evolution of, of our practice so this was a, a vibrating floor we had a soundscape and we we this is actually on the top of the rmit building which is quite well known in australia um and it was just this um very intense sort of gritty experience that we tried to create. 
Um, we've had commissions, so we've created well over 100 buildings now, I'm not sure how many. Um, but there's always something to respond to in appreciating and reading place. Uh, Richard Laplastria talks about, um, who's a famous Australian architect that you may be aware of, um, furnishing a landscape. Um, but responding to context is essentially what it's about. This was a project in New South Wales where the light was much softer and more diffuse in northern New South Wales than what I'm used to. And then the project was driven about the requirement for shade and this very different refracted light, which I, I think is quite beautiful. Mm -hmm. One of the questions that we commonly receive is, is about, you know, how do, how do we work when there is no landscape or mm -hmm. nature to respond to? Yeah. Um, it's a slightly rude question, but that's okay. Um, so this was a, a project that, an interior project essentially, which you know, then it becomes referring to your, your skills as a, just as pure designer, I guess. And this is, I'd say this more like a, it's more like a coat. It's a, it's a little design piece mm -hmm. that's not really um, related to, to place. And it's about generating something that's a protagonist. Mm -hmm. And this sort of opening up of these spaces and this, you know, the moment of blankness and then essentially, you know, these really intense experiential interiors um so this is for an art direction so these are spaces that they go in and try and have crazy ideas and i think they have a lot of parties as well there you go jorge that's me with more hair oh, no. that's your hair <laughs> <laughs> that's <the one> uh, <laughs> From doing our, our projects at GASP, which gave us some national and, and some international recognition, we've got a lot of uh, interest in terms of experiential work. Um, I'm not sure if you're aware of one of the biggest cultural changes in Australia is um, David Walsh's uh, Mona Museum. Mm -hmm. uh, which is in Tasmania and our, our project is a sort of addendum to that. But he then commissioned us or through a competition um, to create what they called a laboratory, um, which was about rectifying the amount of heavy metals in the river. Okay. We, I pointed out essentially in our competition that there's plenty of science about knowledge of the environmental problem that the river has, um, but it was actually a, an issue of sort of hearts and minds. Um, and there was a desire from us to both celebrate the beauty of the water. Um, this is Noguchi's water stone. Mm -hmm. um, uh, but also to allow people to interrogate uh, and, and literally, one of the great things I think about architecture as opposed to art is that it has the ability to be literal without being crass. Um, and I, I like this drawing because I got paid to create a drawing with like four lines on it. That's always fun. You've got to be <laughs> a little bit cheeky. Um, so essentially, this was a, an experience uh, where people walk out into the river they think it's just a sort of art piece. Um, it was it was placed next to a James Terrell exhibit, which I was very excited about. I'm a huge fan of his work. Mm -hmm. um, and the idea is that you're just having an experience and then you, you download an app and it tells you about how much mercury your skin's absorbing. Um, and basically it's trying to push people to become friends of the river and to support the river. And also having this intense experience, that, that, that moment where you realise you are here. Um, and, you know, creating threshold 
and just the basic fundamentals of architecture, there's a real moment in this image where you get to the end of, of this procession and you have to step out into the water and you're stepping into 20 mils of water, but it seems like a significant act. Mm -hmm. um, but there's also the idea of people behind you. They, they want to have this experience too, so you're not allowed to hesitate. And I think playing those sorts of games is something that, that our practice enjoys. Mm -hmm. um, and also, I mean, there's a montage, but there's that, the power of the image. And I think there's a, a real evolution in practice. Like I'm a very big fan of drawing and the sort of traditional discernment of architecture. But I think montaging as well helps us understand what the vision is. Mm -hmm. um, and we can always refer back um, and uh, remind ourselves of where we're going and why. Mm -hmm. One of the great things we've maintained an interest in, in larger scale work and in small scale work. Um, and there are many particular landscapes that we have great affection for. This is the east coast of Tasmania. Um, it's a holiday destination. It's one of the most sublime places. The water is ridiculously clean. It's absolutely beautiful and it's a place I've gone since I was young. Mm -hmm. um, and I think architecture is quite rewarding in that a lot of those places that you develop affection for mm -hmm somehow end up being your project. Um, this project was for an environmentalist who was a farmer. Um, this landscape is uh, it's denuded because it was farmed for sheep. Uh, but it's one of the last stands of the East Coast Oyster Bay Pine, um, which is critically endangered tree species. Um, if you look at the, the small building, a small pavilion in this image, just to the um, left-hand side of the image, there's a, a little group of trees, and that was a, a significant little group of Oyster Bay Pines. Um, and the concept, essentially, was to create a building which took you out into this vast, picturesque landscape and then brought you back to the detail of those particular trees. And this is basically a, um, the, the brief was to say it was like a, a ski lodge, a camping experience without snow, where people staying there would, would help rehabilitate the landscape. Interestingly enough as well, excuse me, mm -hmm. the client made me redesign the whole building to, to minimize steel so I designed the whole thing and then they were like, we, we want to get rid of steel and make it all out of timber if possible, which okay. is not quite possible, but that uh -huh. was an interesting process. It just costs twice as much to do it twice. Uh -huh. <laughs> wow. Um, so it's a very light pavilion. It's about engagement with, with landscape, um, with place. It's not the most picturesque site. It's very much about being embedded in place. And it was entirely, yeah, as I said, everything in it is bespoke design. Um, there's no off the shelf glazing system. Everything's made of angles and timber. And I like the idea that our projects develop a, a material language that <coughs> is emblematic uh, and, and becomes a theme and our job as an architect is to demonstrate mastery of a particular material. This is an interesting project in an Australian context as well because the sort of long, the linear pavilion with the thin roof um, is such a quintessentially Australian type. Um, so this building has no eaves. It's a, a glass pavilion in some ways, or a series of glazed pods, we refer to them as, and then very enclosed sleeping spaces. To move from the bedroom, from the living spaces, you have to 
um, walk outside. Um, and I, that's a very deliberate act. And we had a, a client that was very open to not a, not a glamorous building particularly, or certainly didn't want a pretentious building, but they wanted a building that promoted connection and experience. We designed the, the lighting as well um, for this building and, and it's, I think there's, you know, subtle lighting is very important in a, in a place that doesn't have a lot of light splash. Mm -hmm. uh, I think there's something very beautiful about a singular shaft of light that just goes above the door handle when you're going to bed. Things like that, I think, have really evolved in our work over time. Mm -hmm. As previously mentioned, it's that, that experience and that sequence is, is very important to me. Um, this is where we arrive at the building. I think it's really important that the, the signs and the language of buildings are very clear. Um, as I said, I don't like people to ask me why I've, I've done a particular thing. Mm -hmm. Again, I don't use timber shorts, like I don't use short pieces of timber timber comes in long linear lengths and we should design around that. You kept kept uh, steel? Uh, there's very little steel in it. Yeah, I've got a little bit on the um, window frames. Okay. Made of steel angles. Okay. Uh, all this major structural steel I took out. Okay. Um, Looks very sleek. <laughs> yeah. I tried to make it as slim as possible um, and, and logical. This sort of, that sequence of experience coming in, being held by the building and then slowly revealed into the landscape mm -hmm. was the driving force for the design. And then just doing that with an absolute minimum of structure. Mm -hmm. um, and it takes some dedication because this was a, a remote site. So I had a labor intensive design uh, on a remote site. So that, that means lots of time, mm -hmm. about a year. In terms of the experience of the interior of these pods, the client's very happy to have a, a sense of the farmhouse a refined farmhouse, but where nothing's hidden. Um, they, this building's never locked. You can literally drive to it and, and use it. Um, and the intention was always for um, family and, and uh, people to just visit it when they needed a break or they wanted to help rehabilitate the, the landscape. So these are the clients, Prue and Anthony Houston. Um, they're quite well-known farmers. Mm -hmm. um, and I think, I think we had a, a, a really robust and honest relationship and they love the building. And it's, I think part of being an architect is getting a commission's important, realizing the building's important, but in the long term, when people utilize it and are definitely with you a hundred percent for the entire journey that's when it becomes really gratifying yeah and that, this is the case here um so you can see similar similar themes to some of that that little gas pavilion where i've just framed up this amazing view um again yeah Face fix glazing, just on on standard extrusion angles. Mm -hmm. um, full length timber. It's got a, a bespoke roof. It's, it's not a off the shelf system. It's a design tray. I, I think I probably over designed this a bit. So. <laughs> um, and these little beautiful bunk rooms. Um, yeah, this has very much got the traditional ski lodge. We've got a a window at your feet, which is an awning window, um, all hidden details. They're, they're, these spaces are 
retreats from a day in this incredible bright sunlight. You're out all day planting trees, removing rubbish, whatever it is, and then you need to retreat to a, a very simple embracing space. Mm -hmm. um, one of the interesting things, this is um, one of my children, um, she, she's quite nervous, but when she came to this building, she was immediately very comfortable and just went into the space and played and wasn't concerned about her well-being or anything. It was just a really beautiful thing to see that people respond intuitively um, to the generosity of the building. Um, this was my home, which I think we discussed briefly up in um, Fern Tree in the foothills of Mount Wellington. Um, it has, it's an exercise in timber, again, it, but in a completely different context. It's a mountain house. And the agenda here was, was that um, Fern Tree can be old, claustrophobic and dark. And so the building had to be bright, uh, warm, uh, and have a substantial volume. It does snow, you get snowed in a, a few times uh, a year. Um, and so that was done in 2008, and I've just completed this project, which is in the same landscape. Uh, and I think this is an interesting contrast. One of the projects is, is very cerebral, um, and this project is much more um, bodily. It still has that element, but it's also a far more substantial piece of construction. Essentially, it's a courtyard building. Um, country and Mount Wellington have double the rainfall of the city. Uh, so it was a celebration of what can be seen as a negative element. So, and I think that's an interesting juxtaposition as opposed to the project where I tried to deny the implicit problems. Here we're embracing the problem. The problem is too much rain, but then we sort of celebrate that rainfall. That's a much more substantial construction, sandwich panel, concrete, industrial, um, but then I hope sensual as well. It's a much more, um, in some ways much looser approach to construction. Um, Were they tilt top walls or a boarding place? Concrete? They're precast. Precast. They're precast sandwich panel. Mm -hmm. um, so I have key key um, contractors at an industrial scale. Okay. Who I don't think they ever thought that they were part of um, architecture particularly, uh -huh. uh, but I've worked with them for a long time now. And, and I'm basically, I go to those guys a lot because we get a lot of building it's mm -hmm. a known cost. Yeah. You know the detailing. Um, labor's so expensive in Australia mm -hmm. as well. So you have to avoid labor wherever you can. Yeah. It's pretty fair. So the opposite of that timber pavilion idea. Anyway. Uh -huh. <laughs> <laughs> um, this building as well, we it's in a fire zone. It was the it's a test case for the new um, fire standards in Australia, it's basically a fireproof building. I needed to have a courtyard uh, and in order to protect the courtyard from flame impact, I put these uh, concrete walls in that protect the skylight. It also creates the sort of identity of the building. Wow. This is the, the sort of transcendent moment. This is still being photographed at the moment, but um, once this sort of water curtain embraces the courtyard. There's meant to be a, a rambling garden in the center. Um, I think it's a really beautiful moment. Again, it's mm -hmm. an artful moment, um, but it's also part of the simple practicality of what we need to create. Recollecting um, the water. Sorry? Recollecting the water or not really? Yeah, yeah, yeah. we are, yeah. It goes into a big spoon drain, basically. Mm -hmm. um, so I haven't got the landscape shots because it was photographed on a really miserable day. Uh, this was just a happy snap that I had 
that the central courtyard frames Mount Wellington yeah. and avoids the immediate context of the building, which is actually a sort of standard suburb. That's mm -hmm. very much a, an enclave. I might just pull this curtain down. Hang on. Yeah, that's fine. <laughs> It's a nice detail with the rock, the, the, the other color on that rock, the mm. yellowish. Thank you, that's great. Um, yeah, so this is a, our project on Bruni Island, um, which was for a, a geologist who said to me, you can do whatever you like, but I don't like stone. <laughs> um, <laughs> I don't know what happened there. Um, but uh, yeah, so, it, I think there's a necessity in a, in a in a rural landscape where there aren't a lot of buildings to provide security. These people had originally lived in a, a built-up area, um, and I often refer to the traditional sort of farmhouse building, where you arrange the outbuildings to create a courtyard and a sense of enclosure and security. In this case, I worked with a stonemason who was a, a friend of mine. And we spent sort of three years um, putting this stone together, which becomes, it's just a, an exterior wall, a veneer. And then I've made this very delicate um, timber structure that's sort of um, strung between those elements. And I kind of like that it's, it's, it's as though that's a, a little fine web. And this is the, the embracing moment. This is the security. Mm -hmm. And I like the way that the stone sort of, it looks like it's been pulled out of the sky or something. And it's, it's a really fascinating moment. Um, how, how did you convince him producing a stone? I, I think I just ignore people occasionally. No, <laughs> I don't know. I don't know. I think he, he, he liked the idea. That was his opening conversation. And then I, I sort of talked about the need for security and the need for anchoring yeah. And the desire to to ground the building. And then we compared it to some other buildings that he'd experienced, which were light timber structures. And yeah. we sort of, he evolved to a point of understanding that he didn't want to spend his life savings on a flimsy building. Yeah. Okay. Um, there's something beautiful. I, I always enjoy that the simple contrast between the lines, accentuating the ground by creating a datum, and then this sort of razor sharp precision with our, our glazing details and uh, setting all those elements perfectly. Um, the interior, again, referring to the light in Tasmania, it's very, very bright. But I, so I wanted to create that retreat. Um, similar to those little bunk rooms in our Rocky Hills project. There's a need to sort of pull back, but I also like the idea that these experiences were, were quite piercing uh, and confronting. Um, I think this just shows that simple juxtaposition of elements. I think there are particular ways that stone should be dealt with. Um, you shouldn't, I don't think you should have a, a lintel with stone on top of it. Stone should be stacked up. Mm -hmm. It's monolithic and it just ends at a point and your drawing can just be a square. That's all it needs to be. That The craft and the beauty is in the craftsman. Glass is a precise element that must, must finish at a certain point as well. That it's about its transparency and its framelessness. Mm -hmm. And so this is a, a little exercise in, in elemental construction. Um, also, you know, that's not to say we're subject to our materials. This is the entry to the bedroom. And I like the way that, unlike the rest of the house, it's always the afternoon in the bedroom. The batten screen softens the light. You can go to sleep whenever you like. The quality of light in this building it was really fascinating. It was the, it was the second um, black interior I've done. It's just a black stained um, Tasmanian oak timber. Um, and it immediately affects users. You know, you become quite quiet 
and refined and the nature of shadow and light in these spaces is, is beautiful. Um, that said, I think my obsession with, with detailing and finish and precision also requires, you know, you need, you need good eyes to see that. Like if this is not a great space for someone who doesn't have great eyesight. Yeah. <laughs> mm -hmm. um, again, you can see the, the curve of that rural landscape, the datum created by our building and, it, and a, a very clear sense of destination. Um, we, we're also doing larger scale buildings. This is a, I mean, and I think they're, they're very exciting, but in some ways it's about creating a flexible piece of infrastructure for people to, to live in um, and to respond to particular landscapes. So given that I've talked too long, I'll just skip through this. But again, we can respond to the, to the beauty of the natural world. And water is always this spectacular natural element that we can introduce. And again, it's just about opening up our building so it's furnished by the landscape. Um, so this is a off form concrete building on the east coast again. Um, and this is a, a builder. A lot of my projects, I work with um, developers and builders, uh, usually because they enjoy how I put buildings together and they know it's quite efficient and cost effective. Um, this is just this huge sliding door. Um, and it's just a, a shared building, which is um, pretty much a perfect project for me. Mm -hmm. Again, simple details, uh, very crisp and direct. And the quality of light's interesting. I mean, this could almost be a, a sort of Swiss gallery, but it's actually a, a tradesman's shed. Mm -hmm. um, and he appreciates the beauty of this as well. And we discussed all the formwork details in great, in great lengths. Mm -hmm. um, so this is my current favourite sort of project where I had a client that said he wanted to be my, my best client ever, oh. um, which is a good place to start. <laughs> <laughs> um, it's called the Triptych Project and it's, it's actually four pieces now, not three, but uh, essentially we've got a, a beautiful house here um, that projects out into the landscape. You can see in the distance there's a, a little uh, experiential chamber um, and it's, uh, it's, it's those same construction techniques, long ties, very direct, simple building um, and precision sort of fabrication. Mm -hmm. um, this is a, a little terrace that we created as part of, part of this. And I think there's a, some real beauty and it's just got a simple cut through it that we need to love all of the elements that we're that we're working with and this is my family just enjoying mm -hmm. strange things that dad does <laughs> and it has a, a little glazed pavilion as well um this is prior to the glazing going in you can just see it frames up the the landscape beautifully i pre-cambered the steel again here's the cantilever these are some little vents um, and they pick up light in a really beautiful way as the, as the day evolves. Um, and this is our little, um, we've been calling it a pulmonum, but it's a, it's a reflection pond in the base. Um, and so it just reflects the sky and it's just a, a, a location for solace and uh, reflecting. Mm -hmm. Yeah. <laughs> and that's my final image. Thank you very much. Uh, it's, a, it's it's such a, an amazing where we're gonna we're gonna see if there's any question I'm, I'm sure they're gonna be a little shy because it's in English sometimes but there is one question from Cecilia and it says I don't know if you can read it there Tom, no. congratulations this is awesome clearly your work is inspired by the landscape of Tasmania and artists 
uh, slash architects you have mentioned. Uh, are there any other architects from our past and or present that you find a source of inspiration? Um, absolutely. Um, I don't think there's anyone that isn't particularly um, well known. Um, I think as a contemporary architect, um, I like the, the model uh, and, and the, the work um, that Peter Zunter runs. I, mean, I think that's, I mean, my change in my office was looking at people who are creating this really acute and extraordinary work. Mm -hmm. It's not necessarily about the mass of work. You know, it's not about the quantity of work. It's about quality and setting up a system where you can be as attentive as you need to be to get things right. Yeah. Um, mm -hmm. I, in terms of other than your, your fine self, of course, mm -hmm. um, in terms of architects that I look at, I, I love uh, Leverens. That really, his work to me was a real, a real moment, which I, I'm starting to hopefully see in my work, which is that it's, it's moved from a purely aesthetic to a, a bodily and an experiential process, which is a, an evolution. Mm -hmm. uh, I think it, a lot of his work doesn't photograph that well, but when I went to it, I found it really transcendent and unbelievable. Um, and I didn't think I would like it prior to seeing it. Although lots of people thought I would, um, I think Palladio as well. Um, you know, if we if we I don't like classical architecture as a style, but I think styles are pretty silly thing to talk about. Mm -hmm. um, you know, there's a modern discernment, and I think anyone who interrogates the fabric, the genuine agenda of architecture, which is um, about our place on the on the ground you know and it's about manifesting um reality uh, you know there are and there are people through history that have done that but I'm, a, I'm a huge fan of uh now I, I always refer back to Le Corbusier and and Meese um and and lots of the other sort of classic great architects but I also try not to look too much because by the time we get to this age, you've, you've seen a lot. Yeah, 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 that's true. Mm. Yeah, I think, I, um, how, how do you uh, got into, you, you mentioned at the beginning that you, you resized your office uh, mm. to be able to get into more detail. We can definitely see that each of the projects, uh, you, you get into drawings, uh, very detail of them because you have builders that does it. You're not a design build company. How do you, how, how long does it take you to, to finish up like a very detailed uh, design of a house or, or what's the process that you use to be able to, to sustain? Uh, cause, cause you had more employees and then you decide to go less people. So what was it? How was the decision? Uh, I suppose that is for quality. That's the main thing, yeah. but, no, but there's a limit to what you can do. Um, I've always, and I still am, very hands-on. You know, some architecture practices, uh, you have a, a group of directors and then they have talented staff below them and they might talk about the agenda or, or review ideas from below. Um, we have a flat structure, um, but uh, I, I still draw a lot of the detail um, and I just don't feel like I can make gratifying work. I don't know how you how you go onto site. You know, we, we run sort of um, around 20 or so projects at once. I don't know how you go onto site and really know what's in your buildings. I don't, I don't like to have to flick through sheets of paper to be able to tell someone how it works. Yeah. I've got the building in my mind and I know how it's meant to be put together and there's a lot of repetition and a lot of experience in that. Um, but I, I just like, I had, a, I had a particular year 
um, where we were doing a lot of work for developers. Um, and I made this very small steel structure, which was a boiler room for a hydronic heat system for a house that I designed some years before. And I looked at the end of the year and I said, that's the best thing I've done this year. Why am I running around drawing, you know, 11 storey buildings that aren't very good, that then we get novated to, to a builder and then they employ a different project manager. I just don't, I don't see how you can create that sort of work um, or this sort of work without that level of control. Yeah, yeah, it's it's really amazing how, how you get into that detail. It looks very simple. It look, the, the buildings look extremely simple, but to be able to achieve that, it needs to be a lot of detail. And and, the, and that was on one of my questions on how, like with the builder, like do you do you go to the sites every, how, how long? Because, or, or are they closed? What happens if there is a project that it's, it's in a different location, far away from, and you cannot go- I do there. a lot of driving. Hmm? <laughs> a lot of driving. I have, I have particular builders that I work with often. Oh yeah, that's it. They yeah. commission me to design their houses and things as well, okay. which is really nice. They know. Um, but I work with, you know, a handful of great contractors. Mm -hmm. um, and it, it's, it really varies from project to project. Some, some of our clients uh, have very strict timeframes. Some mm -hmm. of them don't have a time frame at all. Um, and similarly with budgets, we, we get some of our clients that will have, uh, you know, a very strict budget and some are, you know, you can roll it out a little bit more. Part of, part of how my practice has evolved or my role is, you know, for example, this project that's still on screen, where we've got three structures, I'm working pretty much as, a, as the sort of project manager as well. So I've got the budget and I'm allocating it and then informing the client. Yeah. Um, which I think is good. I probably wouldn't have taken that on 10 years ago, but um, mm -hmm. it, it works well for them. And it means I can make decisions quickly and efficiently. Yeah. Um, and then we can have more, more open-ended contracts. Mm -hmm. There's more pressure on, on our firm and our practice to, to manage that well. Mm -hmm. cool. And how about the, in, in, your, in your office, how does it work? Uh, the design process, like you make meetings every, like to be able to, to get into all the details. So is, it, is it a linear, uh, you said uh, everybody's involved or did you start like conceptualizing together or is it, how does it work? It? Um, it really depends. I, I, I still think that um, it's important to, to make a, a functional practice in a, in a small economy you need to be able to do things efficiently and quickly. Mm -hmm. um, I think that when I'm designing something, I'm, I'm good, I'm at my best mm -hmm. early on. I'm quite good, I can do it quickly. Mm -hmm. um, some people need to sort of slowly build. Mm -hmm. That's not really how I work. Um, so sometimes it'll be, I'll meet the client drive away and I'll pull over and I'll sketch in, in my car for 40 minutes or something. And I'll drive to the office and say, let's model this and review it. Mm -hmm. um, other times um, someone else will be running, we'll talk about what we need to achieve and then they'll come back um, and we'll sort of review it from there. But I've usually got, I mean, my work I think is quite particular. Um, and I guess that would imply that um, a lot of it comes from my pen in the end. But I like the idea that we're all collaborators. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I mean, a lot of support and dedication and um, yeah, there's a sort of an intuitive understanding I think that you need to develop. And that I think attitude is, is really massive as well. You need to surround yourself with um, people that believe in what you're doing and enjoy it. Mm -hmm. um, and that's something that um, mm -hmm. I very actively pursue. Yeah. I don't have anyone who's not 
um, passionate about the work we're creating. Yeah, I think you 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 reflect that. You're very passionate. I think it's the the well, how I see your studio. It's a very detail oriented into to be able to achieve that simplicity. Uh, and what I like also is that it's it's a it's it's an art based art based studio. I can consider that like it's mm. you always all the, even when the beginning of the first picture you show it's like you're just showing pictures of art and and then you see the landscape and the, the I like the way you presented the landscape over a black uh, a black and white image of one of the first images mm. and actually on your website you have it that way too that you have mm. the first image of black and white and I think it's very interesting to to be a, a studio that is based in this uh, a magnificent uh, locations and that you are, are seeing it in a more simple way. Is, is that something that, that you feel that it's, it's for, because you have been living there and, you, mm -hmm. and, you, and you've been exposed to that since you were little. How was your, your childhood like uh, to grow? How did you grow up? Did you grow up in those type of landscapes? So, so for you, it's very yeah. simple to show it. For us, maybe that we live in, in, in a yeah. country. I think, I think very much um, there's some mountaineers and people like that in my family and, and you know, that was what my childhood was, was walking around, mm -hmm. getting my eyes burnt, mm -hmm. um, you know, with a, and camping and, and, you know, finding beauty and having that very deep sort of unquestionable understanding of, of landform and... Um, and I guess I, I really hope that people see that, uh, you know, I, I think there's a level of, I don't want to have architecture that appears too complex. Mm -hmm. I'd rather have it, um, I, don't, I don't think that the, the landscape needs some sort of convoluted structure no, no, no. for you to see how beautiful it is. And, and um, so I, I just do those very simple things. Um, and yeah, I hope that allows that conversation to, yeah. to happen between. But at the know. end, you're creating. It's like the way they they compare it to Donald Jude's uh, work. Like in the landscape, these el these elements. Uh, yeah. I, I I I want to congratulations. Be, I congratulate you because it's a uh, the way you you present your 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 job, your work as an architect. Uh, it's in these magnificent places, uh, look, these locations, these landscapes, but but also the architecture becomes a protagonist. Uh, how do you say yeah. it? it? takes protagonism. Is that a word? Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. It's not like it's not like you're just trying to disappear. It, it's yeah. becoming uh, two things at the end, and at the end, I, I really, not I really, an architect is not. Yeah, that's that's how absolutely. I see it. Absolutely, it has an agenda. It's a, it's a protagonist. Mm -hmm. I really don't like insecure buildings. Mm -hmm. I quite like stern buildings. Yes, it's there. It has an agenda. So, yes. and I guess that's a real difference in my philosophy to a lot of the Australian sort of school of architecture. And I think that's derived from. You know my my experience of a particular place and, and particular types of interventions into that place, um, which is, I hope, particular. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah, I don't know. I think they are a little shy because it's in English, and but I think I think yeah. Uh, but I would like to thank you. I think that that um, the the last things we talk about on how how both nature and your architecture uh, becomes one it's it's how how we should close it it's very oh there's somebody franco laser would like to ask a few things let's me franco hey Fernando. Bueno. hey ¿qué onda? hola hey hello spanish okay no <laughs> do you hear me yes yes yeah. yeah? oh, okay Hello, my name is Fernando. It, it was a really nice talk from you, architect. It was amazing. Uh, I would like to, to start uh, telling that your vocabulary is amazing to describe your work. I think you have a, a very good use of your word and you describe your architecture really 
in a really passionate way, as Jorge, as Jorge told before. I would like you to ask, um, how do you deal with, with the fact of the prefab uh, thing, that uh, the, the, the fact that these materials come in a prefabricated way and, and certainly you place them in a, in a really, in a really um, precisely way? And maybe this fact could represent like maybe a, a, some detail that is not really on the place because the fact that this material is in a prefabricated way. So I want, uh, I would love to hear you talk about prefabrication stuff because certainly in Australia, it's really, we have a, a really a lot of laws, I think. So that's another thing I would like to you to ask. So how do you deal with this uh, laws and, and how do you deal with this? Um, um, little troubles that maybe a client is really, really obsessed with a detail, and you have to to really think how will you you deal with it. You, you understand? I think so. I didn't hear yeah. all of that. But if you're asking yeah. how how we um, sort of maintain our agenda, yes, with with our client. Um, as I was saying to Jorge before, the, the work that you promote is the work that you get. Um, and I've always thought it was very important, not only in terms of the built work, but also in terms of my relationship with clients. Um, Yeah. I think you're on mute, Tom. Yes. How does that happen? I don't know. Can you hear me now? It's back. Who mute you out? I don't know. <laughs> it's impossible, but anyway. Um, yeah, so what I was saying, I don't know where I dropped out there, but uh, I think the work that you promote is the work that you get. It's really yes. important. Um, you never... You need to be true to yourself because you're not giving someone anything if if it's not sincere. Um, and one of the jokes that we used to say in the office is that we're not we're not mind readers. So you've got to come to someone with something. Um, yes. And if you make very particular work, then the clients come to you because they want that type of work. And then it's yes. a matter, I think, of of being honest about you know budget procurement time and being a, a real you need to especially in a smaller economy um really master the modes of production and cost and all those elements um otherwise you're not going to realize any work and you're going to have a, a difficult relationship with your client um, yes but well, i think the strongest I, thing is always yeah. presenting work that uh yes that you'd like to, you know, the type of work that you'd like to replicate. And, and one of the nicest things, obviously, is when you come to clients and they can see where your work's going and they want to push you further. Yes. Well, one last thing I wanted to ask you is, what if you could do anything to improve the way people use architecture to express themselves, what will you do? I mean, in, 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 any, kind of, uh, in any kind of circumstances, maybe change a law, implementing a way a way of thinking in a in a new school what will you do to improve the way the way we use architecture to express our feelings or or, or to desire or desire to to do or 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 do whatever I think, we want i think there's um it's a very big question but as a yeah. sort of knee -jerk response i'd say that um i think that when people are, are young architects they need to interrogate their values and have an understanding of what they believe in so that then they can produce work that reflects their belief as opposed to, I mean, there's a, there's a process that everyone goes through and obviously, you know, it's a learned profession and it's pretty clear. My influences are quite clear in my work and I'm unashamed about that, but um, you need to, uh, 
I think it's a real shame that, you know, for example, in Australia at the moment, there's this fashion of concrete arches and then all these great architects are producing buildings with concrete arches and <laughs> it's just pathetic. Like, yeah, I find that. <laughs> Some people are great at it, and, and you know, Richards and Spence, they've produced a beautiful building, the Carlisle Hotel, one of the first ones. They live in a sort of semi-tropical, it's part of the atmosphere, and then that's, now we see that all over Australia, this sort of replication of, of mindless fashion. Um, I think if people could sort of try and avoid that and actually have, have a voice and actually create work that has meaning to them, then others can respond to it. That is a trend. Yeah, we have also Tavo. I, I have a question too. Uh, first of all, thanks for the uh, wonderful work you shared with us. I loved a lot the concepts you, you made about connection, experience and, and sequence. But my question is, is a little more, uh, more about the process. I noticed a lot that you use these uh, black and white pictures at the beginning of the projects, uh, maybe to show a little bit about the context or the details that you wanted to embody in your work. And so my question is, um, what is your relation to photography and how do you relate this to, to your process of understanding the site and developing your ideas? Um, yeah, that's a good question. Um, there's, there's no doubt that um, I've always been a, an athlete and I like the visual aspect um, and I embraced photography when I was younger um, but I also think that architecture is architecture and photography is photography and um, when we're you know there's a whole learned school of photography. I love 1930s black and white modernist photos of, you know, great modern projects. Or, um, and I, I think that with sort of media and, and, and distribution of work, that there's such a strong focus on the, on the visual element, um, on the image. I mean, you can make a beautiful object that'll photograph well, but it might not be a great building. Um, um, so essentially, I'd, I'd say that having a photographer's eye or seeing what is beautiful and that editing process, yes, that absolutely informs architecture. But usually the images that I'm, I show, uh, they're just, they're an image. They, they're not really, they are related to the building because they're of the building, but I do treat them as a, a disparate and a separate element. But I, I, I do, in, you know, another part of it is it's hard to find photographers that enjoy the work. Well, it's not hard, but I try hard to find photographers that enjoy my work. I think that's, that's really important as well, that they're excited about it because um, otherwise they won't sort of reflect its value. But yeah, I'd say it's part of sort of editing and reading place. Um, I think architects need to have a broad range of skills and interests. Um, and some of those are aesthetic uh, and, and that's where sort of photography sits. And I, I've just always, I enjoy that level of abstraction uh, of um, making the elements into discrete entities and reading things with clarity, which photography is about uh, and black and white photography particularly um, but it's also probably a, a let's not forget that some of those images I would have taken on my phone and uh, it's a nice way to cover up a bad exposure <laughs> another, there is another question that somebody uh, how is it that you combine pure forms with straight lines with nature why is it that you don't use organic forms? <laughs> I do. Yeah. <laughs> um, mm -hmm. I think, um, as I said before, there's 
there are a few things that are important. Um, I think the sort of, to sound a little bit trite, but the, the beauty of, of the given of a, you know, a, a beautiful, huge tree that, you know, has this canopy and people can gather beneath it. That has a, a beauty that um, I can't create. Um, so I think the, the, the real answer to the question is that architecture is comprised of particular technologies and materials and there's an understanding of how they should be used. And then just from a technical point of view, and then there's how we use those in a particular context. Not many of them um, are simply manifested in organic forms. That said, I, I used to be teased for, because um, I used to do a lot of black box architecture um, and I still do, I still think black is the, a good colour in our landscape, which is too bright. And in, the buildings fade away into the distance, which is good. Mm -hmm. um, but then, you know, GASP is a, a kaleidoscope of colour and it's a curve. So, but I, I think, you know, there are certain things that appeal um, and you need to know what you're good at. Um, and I think that the, the agenda of a sort of more curvaceous architecture um, would happen with, with larger scale mm -hmm. interventions. Um, but there needs to be a reason for it, I think. Mm -hmm. But maybe when I, I become sort of older and more eccentric, I'll start. I think you need to master straight lines and then yeah, you can first. look at maybe yeah. curves, but yeah. Yeah, there is, a, there is this last question. Um, the work seems so effortless, your work. What do you struggle with uh, uh, to do? Uh, what, <laughs> what do you need to overcome to be able to get to that point? That's the question. Um, uh, thank you, that's a nice thing to say. Uh, it's not effortless. Uh, I find, I think you need to have, yeah, confidence in your discernment, which comes back to knowing, I think, where your disposition is from um, and, and how you understand where you operate and what your values are. Mm -hmm. Then you can, you know, I think Corb said, you know, a concisely put question gives you a concise answer. If you can't, if you have a convoluted question, mm -hmm. you know, which includes your own values, then it's pretty difficult to put together uh, a concise response. Mm -hmm. um, and I, I, I deliberately don't try and um, question myself too much. Like I, I, I question my values, but when I make design decisions, I, I think I'm better the less laboured it is. There's lots of labour in the detail, mm -hmm. but there's not a lot of labour in, in the concept although I often think of all of those things together, but put simplistically, I think, I think that's part of my approach. Yeah. And that's exactly the outcome. I don't want, I, I actually find um, some stonework and some stonemasons, their work is so convoluted and precise that I find that distressing. I, and I remember going to some famous buildings um, just to hark on about Corb, if you know, Ronchamp, which is an amazing building, I, I found it was almost too much. There, there wasn't enough space in it. Mm -hmm. There wasn't enough space for people. It was all about the architect. And, you know, he, he kind of had this little, I, I know you're going to look there and I've put a little decal on the corner of the bench. Like, I don't want my architecture to be distressing and mm -hmm. too loud. It needs to be mm -hmm. a little bit breezy. Yeah, that's not a very good answer. Yeah, I think I think yeah. To to summarize it, you said the last words that you said. It's very important. A lot of a lot of effort effort on the detail, and not a not a lot of effort on the on the concept. But 
but at the same time, sometimes concept for somebody, so for some people is very complicated, but for you, it seems that's what I think it's, it's what, what uh, they were saying. It's that it seems so effortless because you have all this knowledge or, or background of, on, on, on art. So that's, that's, I think that's the way you connect architecture to this, uh, these beautiful landscapes or not even the, only to the landscapes, like the, the building you show the interior, the interior Ooh. space. It's it you it, it becomes a landscape because that space Ooh. when you open it's like it's like opening a window to see see a sunset one there and the colors that you put inside the, 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 the it was I think yellowish color and then the red color on the side or gold Ooh. red so for me it becomes the landscape that so I th I I think uh, I really enjoyed your your talk uh, and it was. Also nice, nice talking to you again for a long time. <laughs> I want sure. to thank you for, for taking the time. I know it's a starting day. You have to, uh, a lot to do on your office. <laughs> but from our school here in, in Tijuana, Mexico, we'd like to thank you very much for taking the time. And we'll hope to, to, to have you again some, some, in some point, or even, even to invite you here to, to Tijuana, if it's possible. That would be great. <laughs> well, thank you very much. Thank you.